but now he's a private citizen. He doesn't hold office, so he's saying, I'm a little surprised you give this petition to me. I am just a private citizen. Usually a petition is given to whom? From whom? He explains this. It's usually like a petition is given from someone who's inferior to someone who's like superior to them? Yes, exactly. It's, a petition is usually given by someone who does not have the power to do something to someone who does have the power to do something, at least in that particular venue or question. Is that the case here? Doesn't really seem so. So the first thing he's going to do is say, well, now that you've done this, I want to point out to you that it's very odd for you to do this because I'm just a private citizen like all of you and you have essentially presented me with a petition and that's very odd because I don't have any position of government or policy or power. And then he also, in this paragraph, stresses the fact that he is what? He is on a trip and he is acting as what? A guest, yeah, yeah, a guest. And what are the old-fashioned and still sometimes honored rules of hospitality in many cultures? What happens when you invite someone somewhere, or perhaps in need, as a guest, they call on you as a traveler? What is the general attitude taken to someone in that condition? very often, and certainly in Henry Clay's day. How do you treat that person? You've invited them. Treat them with politeness, perhaps deference? Yes! <laughs> He's been invited to Indiana. He's going to Indianapolis. Right? It's simple. It's a simple answer, but it's true. So what is he saying? What are you doing now to me? Are you treating me with politeness? That's the implication. Are you treating me with deference? No! You are presenting me with a petition. You are saying something to me about changing my life. So he says at the top of the next page in the copy I have printed, such is the occasion which has been deliberately selected for tendering this petition to me. Which suggests a little that he's being, as we would say today, targeted. He's being targeted. Fair enough. And he's finding a very polite way of saying, you're targeting me. You invite me here as a guest. I'm a private citizen, and you target me. And then he goes a little further and says, you know, Mr. Mendenhall, suppose that you were invited to Kentucky, where I live. And suppose I treated you that way. You came to Kentucky, and all of a sudden I shoved something in front of your face. I, and the implication is, I'd never do such a thing. My manners are better than yours. I know better. That word hospitality is used at the end of the top paragraph, the second line of the next paragraph, and the end of that second paragraph. Repetition can be very helpful in speeches, even more than in written addresses. Hospitality, hospitality, hospitality. You treat anyone with hospitality, you treat them properly. You don't offend them. It's similar to the word hospital, similar to the word hospice. This is, a, this is a situation where you're supposed to take care of someone, not confront them. So then he goes on and says something that <coughs> begins perhaps to tip his hand in a way that is um, revelatory. He says, you controvert the legitimacy of slavery and deny the right of property and slaves but in my state, it's the law. And I live in my state. And my law sanctions, authorizes, and vindicates it. And in, in rhetorical style, that's called a triad. You know, three words, they build up. You hear it often in rhetoric. Barbara Jordan used it to great effect during the impeachment hearings of Nixon in the 1970s, a congresswoman from Texas. It's a triad, and you generally try to get the words to increase in force and sometimes in length. Sanctions, authorizes, and vindicates. And who are the petitioners whose organ you assume to be? Well, perhaps some by erroneous representations have been induced 
inconsiderately to affix their signatures. Now, what is he casting aspersions on about the nature of the petition? Are you saying the people who sign it are, don't really believe in it? I mean, they've been sort of coerced. To yes, sign it? maybe they've been conned into it. Maybe they didn't know what they were signing. And then, quite remarkably, uh, but tipping his hand again, he says, who are some of these people? Well, I don't know, but I am told that they are free blacks, men, women, and children who have been artfully deceived and imposed upon. Now, do you think someone told him that? We don't know. Maybe. What do you do when someone in an address or writing says, so-and-so told me that? You have no way of knowing. It's hard for you to run an investigation and call up witnesses. And, but he says that. And if he says that, then maybe people did say it to him. And if people did say it to him, then maybe some people in the audience will think it's true. It's very hard to disprove. <coughs> Virtually impossible to disprove. So Clay has now essentially gone on the offensive here in a certain kind. And he says then at the bottom of that page, what is the foundation of this appeal to me in Indiana to liberate the slaves under my care in Kentucky? It's got no basis. Each state has their own laws. It is a general declaration in the act announcing to the world the independence of the 13 colonies that all men are created equal. Now, as an abstract principle, there is no doubt of the truth of that declaration, and it is desirable. So you remember, Douglas uses this. Lincoln uses it. Martin Luther King Jr. uses it. It's been used all throughout American history. It's been used very recently in political speeches in this country. All men are created equal. Then, Clay goes into an argument about that phrase and about the Constitution. What is his argument? Um, well, he kind of starts off by saying that, like, you can't have a society where everyone's equal and, like, there's always going to be inequities. Yeah. That's, that's a really interesting gambit. Now, <laughs> you look at your text. Who are the people who suggest aren't going to be equal? Um, Top of page 59. Oh, women. Uh, women, yep, yeah. That's one, one right there, women. Uh, minors. Minors, yeah. And... You know, there are lots of things we don't let minors do. That's fair enough, I suppose, yeah. but... Uh, criminals. <laughs> criminals, right? Yeah, and then I think the insane. He said. The insane? Yeah, yeah. have we um, run out of the list? Let's see. Culprits, okay. transient <laughs> sojourners, meaning vagrants or homeless people. Mm -hmm. That's what that means, okay? And they will, and then here's a remarkable tell. Anybody here play poker? What's a tell in poker? Good, we have a poker player. Um, it's a tell is some action or movement or a word, like anything that can indicate what a player has under Yeah, his it's, a, it's a kind of clue that's given without it being intended to be given. So here's an interesting tell, and it happens a lot in rhetoric. He says, all of these individuals, women, minors, insane, culprits, transient sojourners, that will always probably remain subject. Now, what do you think of that construction, always probably? <laughs> Isn't that an interesting phrase? Always probably. Now, there's betting on future fact for you. He doesn't say always. He says always probably. That is a bit of a tell. Just as much as it is a tell when he or anyone else, as he sometimes says in this speech, says things like, there can be no question that. Whenever you hear that or read that, what should your antennae do? There can be no question that. Try to think of a question. Try to disprove that yes. there can be no yes. question. Yes, when someone asserts that there can be no question, or when someone simply says without any citation, the best authorities say, 
and then there's no actual citation. Be suspicious. Have you ever run across statements like that? Yeah, I run across them in textbooks. I run across them in literary criticism. I run across them in cultural commentary. And whenever I see a phrase like that, I always wonder, really? No matter who's writing it, and no matter from what position or political part of the spectrum they are writing from, I immediately say to myself, oh, really? Let's look at that more closely. Now here, he says, Pro always, probably. Well, then he goes forward about this declaration and says, it would be a virtual emancipation of all the slaves within their respective limits. You can't expect this in Virginia or Kentucky. And then he says, you know, what was permitted under the Constitution? Was slavery permitted under the Constitution? Seemingly so. He says, well, so there you have it. So much for all men are created equal. The slave trade from Africa was permitted all the way till 1808. Is that true? Yes, it's true. It's true. So he is amassing an argument in favor of the legality. Now, a little later on, what does he say about his own personal view of slavery? Very interesting. He says that it's a great evil. He says it's a great evil. He says it's abhorrent. Yet, does he want to continue to own his slaves? Yes. And he says, well, why shouldn't we just then emancipate every person who's enslaved? What's his argument about not doing that? He believes that they emancipate it, then it would create like immediate like chaos and like war through the races because they wouldn't know what to do from like there, and then they would try to kind of like get power, and then like the whites would try to maintain power, and that would just create like a war overall. Yes, and he uses that word immediate, I think, two or three times, that that this immediate emancipation would lead to something terrible. It would lead to bloodshed, it would lead to violence, it would lead to black against white, it would lead to blacks wanting to get power and have the upper hand, and then it would lead to whites resisting that. And we, this, this is not something that we can stand for. It's not, you cannot have utter chaos in a society. He actually uses the phrase civil war, but there, the civil war that he's envisioning doesn't seem to be a civil war of the southern states against the northern states. It seems to be a civil war of what? Race war, yes. Now, this is his supposition of what's going to happen if there is abolition. Interestingly enough, are abolitionists in a majority in the north at this time? People who want immediate abolition, are they in a majority? No, they're not. They're a strong vocal minority in 1842, but they're not a majority. So then he goes on and says, I wish every slave in the United States was in the country of his ancestors. What do you make of that sentence? <laughs> well, was there a significant movement that people said, well, anybody who's enslaved who came from Africa originally, was, well, let's have those people go back to Africa. Did that in fact happen to some people? Yes, it did. So he is fending off the notion of emancipation in every way that he possibly can. Uh, on page 598 that you have, he says, what then would certainly happen? This is the new paragraph there. He says, a struggle for political ascendancy. He said the whites would be brought in complete subjection to the blacks, exclamation point. Now, that's not just talking about a race war. When he says the whites would be brought in complete subjection to the blacks, exclamation point, is he using logos, ethos, or pathos? Pathos, yeah. And what kind of pathos? What emotion? Fear. He's using fear. He is using fear. He's saying, you're going to be subjected. This is a message of fear. And it's a pretty strong message of fear. Don't forget, Clay had been an esteemed politician. He had won votes in many parts of the country as well as in his own state. And this is what he says, is all due to the unfortunate agitation of the subject of abolition. The abolitionists are, in effect, troublemakers. Now, to give you a little more context here, 
because uh, this course is partly about American history. It's interesting, I think, to note. Richmond, Indiana is to this day a town much populated by what religious group? He talks about it in this address. The Quakers, yes. And the Quakers were very strong in support of abolition. Quakers who later, in many cases, also were pacifists and for disarmament. The Society of Friends were strong supporters of abolition. And so, to this day, there's a Quaker college in Richmond, Indiana, called Earlham College. Many of you may have heard of it. It's a Quaker institution. So he addresses that, and then he does something quite remarkable. He says, you know, there, I could free my slaves, but what would happen to them? This is, again, probable future fact. What would be the case with some of them, he says? They won't be able to survive. They're too old. They're too infirm. And then a, another group, he says, quite remarkably, he says, they don't want to be emancipated. And then he turns to someone and says, what my treatment of my slaves is you may learn from Charles, who accompanies me on this journey. So he has Charles there. Now, what kind of proof is this? Is it artistic or is it non-artistic as a mode of persuasion? It's non-artistic. He's calling forward a witness. He's calling forward Charles. Now, do we do this today? Sure we do. Do you ever see a State of the Union address where the president will say, there's so-and-so, and they'll point to someone up in the gallery, maybe a person who was decorated in war, or maybe it's a first responder, or maybe it's a person who's done charity work or something like that. But there is a person. It's very hard to deny to a person's face what that person is or has done. It's a witness. It's a kind of personal testimony. Now, of course, Charles is not going to speak for himself. But Clay says, Charles has been with me for a long time. He's been up in the Canadas, meaning where at any time, if he just left, he could have been free. But he didn't do that. And he says, excuse me, Mr. Mendenhall, for saying that my slaves are as well fed and clad, look as sleek and hearty, and are quite as civil and respectful in their demeanor and as little disposed to wound the feelings of anyone as you are. Let me recommend you, sir, to imitate the benevolent example of the Society of Friends. Their ways do not lead through blood, revolution, and disunion. They have no political objects to subserve. Now, if they supported abolition, is that an accurate statement? Yes. 